Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to a, uh, another action-packed, fun-filled, exciting What Matters to Me and Why. And uh, my name is John Stupar. I'm a member of the organizing committee. And I'm just kicking off our event with some introductory remarks. And uh, for those of you who may not have known about what we do here, I just want to uh, mention that since the fall of 2012, we've hosted this luncheon uh, monthly throughout the academic year, except for June and December. And we've now given 12 members of our faculty or staff an opportunity to open their heart, their soul, to the UCI community and share what matters to them and why. This program was developed with the intention to encourage reflection on values and beliefs and motivations in the lives of those people who shape our university. This series explores personal journeys, experiences, choices made, difficulties and even faith encounters and commitments formed, challenges and joys revealed, all with the hope that these stories would help us all understand diverse pathways in life and work and even leadership. Such understandings we believe are crucial for fortifying tolerance, strengthening bonds, and supporting the virtues that make us who we are here at UCI as we really and truly celebrate diversity here. And so today's feature speaker is our very own atmospheric chemist, distinguished professor Donald Blake, who will be introduced by Rebecca Thompson. And before that, though, I want to invite you to join us next month. Uh, it's always the second Wednesday of the month. That'll be April 9th to hear Cecilia Lynch tell us about her unique journey and perspective. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Rebecca Thompson. I'm a second year PhD student in psychology and social behavior. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker to you all. Um, I'm particularly excited about this month's talk because Dr. Blake is actually a PhD student at UCI himself, much like um, myself and you all. So um, it's great to get to hear um, about his experiences. Um, um, so he, like I said, got, he earned his PhD in 1984 under our, one of our esteemed Nobel laureates, uh, Professor Sherwood Rowland, um, and continued to study atmospheric chemistry um, in the later years as well as um, a colleague. Um, the Rowland had a luxurious career here at UCI. Um, the Rowland like group regularly publishes in such um, small outlets you might have heard of, like Science and Nature. And um, so given this, you might expect him to be um, extremely intimidating. However, during our meetings with him, we found him to be extremely approachable, um, someone who deeply cares about his students, um, and even um, is apparently incapable of turning down speaking engagements. <laughs> so is has to give everyone the opportunity to educate themselves about the science behind global climate change. So we are very happy that he has time in his busy schedule to speak to all of us today. And well, thank you. Um, this is a little bit more intimidating than I thought. Not just because it's standing room only, but uh, I'm used to working with like slides to keep me on track. I see some of my former students in here and I'm thinking, oh, they just know the horror stories of me starting to talk about something and I end up talking about salad dressing or something. So um, this, this, this could go wrong quickly. So what I've done, I actually have some notes, which I never have. Um, never. I never have notes. So, um, so I, a few of these things I feel like I need to just like read and then I can expand on them. Um, so what matters to me and why? So when I was, when Doug first asked me if I would do this talk, um, I think I took a little bit of a different approach and it wasn't so much exactly why things mattered, what matters to me, but why those things matter to me. 
So I, I, I tended to get a little, little get bogged down in the, the first part. So I'm hoping that, that this doesn't go south on me. Um, but anyway, so another thing you need to understand is, is that I am really a shallow person. <laughs> Just ask my colleagues um, and my group. And so this was quite a challenge because smart people, they, they know why they do things, okay? If you're not so, if you're shallow like me, you just do things and you're not always sure why you're doing those things. And so this caused me to sort of reflect on, on this. And so, so first off, I need to say that obviously my wife and three children mean everything to me, okay? In case my wife sees this. <laughs> I told her, I told her she couldn't come because she wasn't a student or something. So, so anyway, Lori, I, I, I love you and the three kids more than anything, so uh, I got that out of the way. <laughs> so, unlike many of my colleagues here, I was not a very good student growing up. Um, in high school, my graduating class, okay, so first of all, I was born in Orange, okay, in 1952. Lived there for a year, moved to San Diego County, uh, and, and grew up there. And so I graduated from Escondido High School, and I, I think the numbers are correct. I, there were 395 seniors who graduated uh, in, in my year. And uh, in the last 10 years, I've sort of reconnected with some of my coaches and, and professors at the school, and one of them gave me my transcript and my rank in my class. And I was number 165. Which, yeah, 165 out of 395, solid upper middle class, okay? So that is, that is me, and I've sort of seen myself as just a slightly above average person my entire life. Um, and so that actually plays into why I am who I am. So at age 18, um, I received, this was 1971, uh, there was a war going on. And I received this in the mail. It says, Selective Service System, Notice of Classification. Is, Donald R. Blake is classified as 1A. And, and if you go on the other page, it says 1A means fit for military service. So that was in August. Uh, by January, right after I turned 19, I was in boot camp. And so life changed. These people, I mean, I thought, I thought everybody could swim. <laughs> Seems silly, but for a, a person who you know, was close to the beach, swimming. I thought everybody could read get to boot camp, you find out that there are people who cannot read. And so this was a, a huge upheaval uh, to be in a situation sleeping in the same room like this size with 78 guys, or 75 guys, of which some wet the bed, um, you know, some had marks across their back from having been beaten by their father. I mean, this was a, a, a very traumatic thing. But anyway, after boot camp, I was, I, I had actually taken a test, a little bit like the SAT, and, uh, and I had scored well enough on it to be allowed to sort of choose which of these different things I wanted to go into. And I ended up going into intelligence. And so, turns out that because there were drafting people, there were people with teaching credentials and master's degrees and things like this that were actually in the service. And that particular rating of intelligence had a higher level of education than the regular military. The regular military was you know, about a junior year in high school. Um, what I was in was second year college. And so I had been in college one quarter before I got drafted because they quit the student deferments. And so I really was an undereducated person within this group. And for those of you who have not been in the military, trust me, there's a lot of boredom 
It is boring most of the time. It's hurry up and wait. And so there was this game that we would play. We worked 12 on, 12 off. And there was this game that we would play that was the, the more modern version of Trivial Pursuit. And so instead of having cards, you just came up with questions yourself. And so there'd be five or six people during the, 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 the quiet periods and it would be like, okay, Ken, what was the name of Alexander the Great's horse? <laughs> you know? Now, so you could make up your own, and you know, who knew whether you knew the answer, but you would ask, you would specifically ask somebody the question, okay? And what scared me was, was that these people who'd gone to college always answered. Correct or not, they answered. And I couldn't answer anything. I mean, I, my whole high school reading was the sports page. And so I knew very little. And so this one guy that had a master's degree, actually months into this, would preface his question with, Don, here's a simple question for a simple mind. <laughs> yeah, not funny. Because that question, I, I would get that same question that I could never answer time, a dozen times a night for months on end. And if you were in the middle of your high school class and you couldn't answer any of these questions that others seemed to be, I think he was just a real jerk, okay? <laughs> and I think that he would like come up with the hard questions for me. And then he would ask other people simple questions. In any event, he had me convinced that I really was not a very smart person. So it was a very mean thing. And, and I, I uh, so this, you've made me think that this assignment that I was asked to do uh, has made me sort of remember those, those memories. And so I remember one night and, and I said to this group, so what is the hardest subject in, in college? And they talked amongst themselves and they said, they came up with chemistry. And I said, what's the highest degree? And I always thought a master's degree was as high as you could get. And they said, a PhD. And it was at that point where I decided, I, to, to prove that Don Blake was not a simple mind or as, as simple as they thought, that's what I needed to do to convince myself. And so I got out of the service and that's what I did. And so, um, so once again, that is what drove me and that's what continues to drive me um, to, to try and continually prove to myself that I'm not that simple-minded person. And, um, and so, so I, in, in the long run, it was a good thing to happen, but it was not a pleasant thing to happen. Uh, I better start marking things off here. Jeez, okay. <laughs> Trivial Pursuit, hired, okay, I already did the whole page, whole front page. This, this lecture's going quick. Okay, so, how much time do I have? 40 minutes, oh great. Okay, so, so, um, so I did my tour. And something, I might have mentioned this to John and Doug when they were in my office, but something that bothers me today, um, didn't bother me then, 40 years ago, but um, when we returned on the military flight from overseas, you land in a city, doesn't matter, it could be San Francisco, it could be Los Angeles, it could be wherever, um, and you fly on what's called a MAC flight, or a military air command flight, and always wear your uniform. Um, we were told, I mean, I was just night, I was 20, told by guys who had actually returned to the States, you know, a year or two before and then deployed again, um, to bring civilian clothes. And that as soon as you get to the military base, change. Okay. Um, and so, carried a bag, changed, went to the airport, and then flew home in civilian clothes. And the reason for this was because the Vietnam War was not a popular war, particularly sort of late 60s, early 70s. And so we were 
maybe innocent enough to think that we, with our high and tight haircuts, and most guys look like Rebecca here. I mean, you know, well, you know, back in the 70s, there's probably guys in this room right now who had hair down to here, and then we show up, you know, with nothing. We think we can put on a civilian clothes and blend in, and it didn't work. But, but it still bothers me that, that we were so almost embarrassed to wear our uniforms because we didn't want to be judged. Um, and so as a result of that, most people who served during that Vietnam era just didn't talk about stuff. We didn't talk about the war, um, and we were maybe a little bit ashamed almost to have participated, okay? I got drafted, could have gone to Canada, but I didn't. And so I was personally never ever treated poorly. I, 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 I can say I was never, but, but there are some who were, and, um, but we just kept quiet, okay? And, and so when I was at UCLA as an undergraduate, it, it kind of bothered me a little bit. And when I came to Irvine to go to sort of have an interview for, for graduate school to see if I was going to you know, go to this school, I met Sherry Rowland, first person. He's huge. <laughs> He's about 6'5", okay. Um, and so he was big literally and figuratively. And um, I immediately like fell for this guy because I found out, as he told me, that his work, I mean, I'd, I'd heard a little bit about the ozone hole, or ozone layer, but basically he told me the kind of research that his group was doing. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. So Sherry Rowland was the first chair of chemistry, okay? Um, he won the Nobel Prize in 1995. I joined his group in 1978. And what was so intoxicating about him and his work was that he was working on stuff that you could talk about. That, you, that, that if you told people, I'm working on air pollution, people said, oh, cool, you know, or, or, or thank you, because we couldn't talk about what we had done as kids. And so that whole thing, that whole military experience has really guided me over the last 40 years in trying to do something positive. I mean, I think most people want to do things positive. Most people want to help other people and you want to learn and have fun. And, and these are all things that Michael Drake, his seven things that he talked about. Um, his seven are sort of my seven, but my motivation for those seven is a little bit different. And so, so once again, I am who I am because of my parents, how I grew up, and the war, okay? Then I meet Sherry Rowland, and, and I wrote here, what did I say? Uh, few veterans served, okay, no, no, Don Blake, and most slash all other veterans wanted slash needed to be associated with something positive. So a lot of, I'm not alone in, in how I feel about this. In fact, the odd thing is, is that these two Marines and this uh, sailor, uh, yeah, that I was friends with, and one of them almost got kicked out of the Marine Corps for smoking too much marijuana. Um, you know, another one fought all the time. I never met anybody who fought, had as many fights as this guy, <coughs> different person. Other guy had hypertension, whatever. Turns out one of them's a professor at the University of South Florida. One of them's a professor at Clemson. And one of them, the, the marijuana guy, um, is a judge. <laughs> Not in Colorado, Barb, no. <laughs> and you know, when he was being interviewed, he said, okay, let me tell you something. I smoked a lot of weed, but I have not smoked since May 2nd, 1973. So if this is a problem, Let's just end this right now. And they said, okay, we believe you. But anyway, these are people who wanted to contribute, okay? And I think that a lot of us vets feel that need. Sherry Rowland was my vehicle, okay? Sherry Rowland was my entry into working on stuff that allowed me to be viewed as a contributor, okay? And so for, for that, I will, Forever be thankful to Sherry, who, by the way, 
on Monday is his two-year anniversary for passing away. Um, so, and, and, and so we have this beautiful um, exhibit in Roland Hall that I walk by every morning when I come to work and I see pictures of Sherry and I see things that he, he did and all. And um, I remember well, a few months ago, it was a Saturday and I, I called his wife, Joanne, and I said, you know, Joanne, I've always known I was a shallow person, but I didn't realize how shallow in that I miss Sherry, not just because I miss talking to him and seeing him and bouncing ideas off of him, I miss being seen with him. <laughs> he was like a rock star. And, I can't, and imagine being a graduate student, okay, in 1982, we went to a meeting in Williamsburg, Virginia. And there were a couple of us grad students from Sherry's group, but it was like the who's who of atmospheric sciences. Truly, everybody who was anybody was there. And imagine what it's like to be a graduate student and be sort of standing in the corner because most of the people there were professors and postdocs and have the biggest dog in the room come over and say, Don, should we get some lunch? <gasps> I mean, it was an absolute thrill. And he always made sure that us kids were introduced to the other big shots, you know? And so that the, uh, the things that I benefited from, I mean, I, in, in 1987, three years after I graduated, I testified before a full Senate committee. Al Gore, Tim Worth, Brad, I mean, because Sherry couldn't go. They didn't want me necessarily, but I mean, I mean, I mean they, didn't, they didn't call Irvine and say, can Don Blake come? They called, this is before the internet, folks, okay? Some of you gotta understand, we had phones and letters. They, they contacted Sherry and Sherry says, I, I can't be there, but you know, Don Blake could come and talk about trace gases. So there I was with, you know, uh, an incredible group of, of uh, climate scientists. I sat right next to Jim Hansen and right next to uh, Ramanathan. I mean, two big heavy hitters. And so that was because Sherry couldn't go. I also, when Sherry got the Nobel Prize, you can invite 10 people to the Nobel ceremony. It's like a week long. And two of the 10 people were my wife and me. So, you know, I mean, you can see why I idolized the man. And, 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 but I miss just going to lunch and having people think that I'm an important person <laughs> because I'm with an important person. It's a true story. Okay. Now, how are we doing on time? Oh, geez. 10 minutes? Yeah, about 10 more minutes because we're going to have questions and answers. I hate questions and answers, so how about if I talk for 40? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now what I thought I would do because it, I always sort of try and guide the way I do things by, on how Sherry Rowland would do things. And Sherry would not approve of me standing up here just rambling on about Don Blake. Okay, he would say, Don, these people deserve to leave here with more than just Don Blake stories. And so talk about the kind of research we're doing. Okay, how is it that we're making a difference? And so until Doug says I'm done, I'm going to talk about some stories. Everything's a story. Sherry Rowland was a storyteller, okay? He told me stories. I had no idea why he was telling me the stories. <laughs> I swear. He would tell me stories about his kids. He would tell me stories about his graduate students. And sometimes it was a week later, and sometimes it was 20 years later when I finally realized why he told me that story. You know? And it was amazing. Um, so anyway, I tend to... I'm, I know Sherry Rowland, and I am no Sherry Rowland, but I will tell some stories. So, my, what I think is sort of one of my biggest impacts that I've had on science, was, came out of a meeting in Mexico City where they had a meeting called the 100 Great Minds, or something like that. Um, and of course, Sherry was invited. And he happened to sit next to the mayor of Mexico City. And the mayor goes, you know, we have a big pollution problem here. Can you help us? And so Sherry Rowland, who never did any work in the lab, came back and says, Don, who did work in the lab, <laughs> I told this guy we would do something, do it. 
And so I didn't do anything for about six months, and he kind of says, you know, Don, you forgot I asked you to do something. And so we, we, we actually sent an undergraduate student from our group down to Mexico City to collect air samples in parks and open areas. Because what we do is we do gas chromatography. We can take a, if, if this were full of air, we could take that air and run it through one of our gas chromatographic systems and come up with the concentration of a hundred or more gases. And it's a very powerful tool. It was important that we could do this because of stratospheric ozone. These are gases that destroy that. So for Sherry's research early on, it was important. Um, it's important for learning about what are the sources. You go into a city, and if we look at this room right now, we have 100 people in here. We have 100 sources of gases, okay? Somebody has some perfume on. Somebody's got some deodorant. Somebody, you know, uh, has hair gel. Every one of you is giving off a different fingerprint of gases, okay? But let's say that there are half of you who all use the same deodorant. We could take some samples in here and we would find that there were three or four gases that really seemed to predominate. And then we could try and backtrack and say, the source of this is this. So we sent a student into Mexico City in 1991. She collected some air samples in parks and stuff and also collected samples from two a house and a taco stand, okay? Came back, we analyzed the, the, the samples, and it turns out that just from those eight samples, we determined that a major problem in terms of pollution in Mexico City was leaky petroleum gas tanks, okay? Whereas here in this country, you have a, a, a stove or a heater at home, you use natural gas. Well, in Mexico City, there is no natural gas. It's all LPG propane and butane. In these tanks, okay, that you see, or that you go to the, if you have a barbecue, you go to the gas station or something and they fill that with, with LPG. Turns out there's about a million tanks in Mexico City and they were all leaking, or some of them were leaking. And so just by our little tiny study, we followed up by a bigger study, followed up by a paper in Science um, in 1995. By 1998, three years, there was law established, regulations in Mexico City that said the LPG can't have more than a certain level of these very reactive gases that form a lot of ozone because of our study. And pollution, ozone pollution in Mexico City has decreased. Now, it hasn't decreased just because of that, but what we did helped. And I gotta tell you, it is Unbelievably, um, unbelievably humbling and intoxicating to think that research that was done in part by you actually can affect 18 million people. It's not like it affected two people. And in Sherry Rowland's case, his work on stratospheric ozone, it affected 8 billion people. Okay, so ours was, my project was 18 million. I'm still happy about that, okay? <laughs> But, uh, but that's the kind of thing, very simple. So sort of simple-minded stuff. And so we have followed this type of trend since Metro City was in 1991. Right now we're doing a study in Hong Kong, okay? And, and it's a taxi study. And it turns out that a little bit in part of what we did in Mexico City, Hong Kong said 12 years ago, I believe, that all of their taxis, and there's 18,000 taxis in Hong Kong, um, all of their taxis were going to be shifted over from diesel to LPG, okay? Um, since then, and that was a good move. I mean, diesel, as we know, generally uh, has a lot of soot and, and uh, some bad stuff that comes out of the tailpipe. Um, what we did then, a few years ago, was we did a study to see what is actually coming out of the tailpipe of, of taxis. And it turns out that while all of these taxis were passing smog every year, none of them passed once they had their tests done. How's that happen? So they would go the day before their test or the day of their test and just rent a catalytic converter. <laughs> Drive over to the place to test, the smog-only place, pass, 
get the stamp, come back, take this off, put the crappy one back on, and now they're good for another year. Okay. Now, problem was, was that these catalytic converters that they had, that they were using, were just horrible. And when we, our group went over and we took samples behind these taxis, oh my gosh, it's horrible. And so Hong Kong says what we're going to do is we're going to buy and install for free 18,000 catalytic converters. So that you don't have to worry about going to somebody's you know, midnight Kelly Converters shop. <laughs> so starting October 1, they are replacing. And at the end of this month, they'll be done. And we're collecting samples in Hong Kong starting in September, which was the month before the Kelly Converter Exchange Program. And then did the same thing in October, November, December, January, February, and March. And what we're seeing is the gases that we told them the gases that we had measured in the tailpipes of before the new catalytic converters, because we did a study, two samples before the catalytic converter was changed, then they went, got a new catalytic converter, they came back, we took two more samples from the exhaust pipe, and then they did some tuning. And so we knew what it was going to look like when you went from a crappy catalytic converter to a new one. And the emissions reduced by about a factor of 100. So anyway, we, we knew that going in, and I told them, sort of boldly, these three gases are the ones that are going to be decreasing the most during this period. Good news is they did. So they have decreased by about a factor of two. So that the propane and the butanes now are at least a factor of two lower in Hong Kong. This means this is good for pollution. I mean, it, it would reduce some of the ozone. There's some other things that are happening. And the, the key here, though, is that now that the experiment has been done and it's successful, Hong Kong is hoping that Shanghai and Guangzhou, some of these places that have 10, 15, 20 million citizens and lots of taxis, that now they'll have seen what happened and that it actually worked and that it's actually cost effective to buy these things and get this pollution reduced. So this is sort of, the, it's like as Hong Kong goes, the rest of China may go, and this is the big hope. So once again, really exciting stuff. So this is something that once again may actually affect all of China, not just China, that, that this type of research. So anyway, very exciting. Doug, am I done? Darn it, okay. Yeah, wait, 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 okay. I got, I got one more quick story. And we're doing a study of the Hodge. Okay, and so, a former postdoc of Sherry's called me up and he says, look, Don, you know, we have a proposal. This guy's a Pakistani guy. He says, we're, we've, we've got money to do a study. And what we're looking at is the impact in Mecca on Mecca air quality um, during the Hajj. And the Hajj is the pilgrimage that happens, you know, right about now it's happening in September, October. And um, it's where you end up with Mecca has maybe a million or two inhabitants. And in 2012, they had about four or five million pilgrims that showed up. 18,000 buses used for like two weeks just to haul these people around. Then they have to walk, they go through tunnels. And, um, and so that's during the Hajj. And then we have samples collected at the same locations during the non-Hajj, maybe in, in May. And we make comparisons and it's scary the levels of some gases in these tunnels um, are such that the EPA would say you would need a gas mask. So it's the first time this kind of thing has been studied. Once again, I didn't propose this. We were asked. That's how the Roland Group has been. We've been asked to be involved in more projects than we've ever applied for. So it's kind of easy. Um, so when my dean, Ken Janda, says, gee, Don, you know, you're pretty successful getting money, I have to smile and say yes, but <laughs> most of it's just been handed to me. So uh, anyway, so that's an, an interesting study. One more thing, we're doing breath analysis. Okay, so we made a little bit of a tangential move where we took the instruments that we use for measuring gases for Hodge and whatever pollution studies and said, well, now let's go ahead and take samples of people's breath and see if we can find some information in that 
in the suite of gases that we see that might tell us something about what kind of a disease or problem they have. So anyway, I, what I've said here, second to last thing, for me, work is not work. About 300 days a year, it's play. Okay, that is exactly how I feel. And the last thing, thanks for forcing me to think about what matters to me. Thank you. <laughs>
The California Air Resources Board does a very good job of regulating things, things we can't do or that we shouldn't do. Um, I mean, always drive less. Uh, you know, that, that, that's, you know, recycle. Those are the kinds of things that I, I tell people. But, I mean, California, we, we really, we have, I mean, if we think about it, um, if we go back to the 60s, Riverside, which is downwind of Los Angeles, it was not unusual for Riverside to have ozone levels and readings of 500 parts per billion of ozone. Now, they don't even make it over 200. And yet we have four times as many cars. So we really have, and, and we're, we're a model, we made mistakes. And we made mistakes, and so part of the work that, that, that is done in China and Hong Kong is to point out to them, look, you don't want to do this. This didn't work for us. This would be a better approach to take. Um, just conserve. That sort of obviated my second question, which was, do you have any regulations that you're promoting at this time? I'm a shallow guy. So I, I just follow rules. Yeah, I'm sorry. That obvious, okay, yeah, sorry. Oh. <coughs> Must be you. Yeah. Mr. Sherwood went to Roland into a like, years of criticism before like, he get to recognition. Do you, you receive any criticism? When oh, gosh. Question? Huge criticisms. Okay, so the question is that, you know, Sherry Roland got a lot of, of uh, uh, admiration and, and positive, uh, uh, you know, press. But while he was proposing that CFCs were going to destroy stratospheric ozone, there was a huge industrial push that um, you know, pretty much made it sound like he was just a, a, a nutcase. And uh, so, and interestingly, he was really good at that. I mean, he was, he was the most calm man. I mean, I have never seen, I never saw Sherry. I worked with him for 34 years. And I never saw him raise his voice ever. Somebody would say something to him or it would be in the press and because I am not like Sherry, um, I just would just get raging mad. I mean, I was ready to fight at times, <laughs> you know, and Sherry was like, gone, calm down, you know, I mean, so he was, he was the perfect person, the perfect mouthpiece for the work that he and Mario did back in the 70s because he was this you know, very bright, very confident, and very calm man. Hi, Don. Hey, Tom. Um, you were um, talking about how you felt they made a difference in Mexico City and Hong Kong. But right now, in other Chinese cities, the large ones, we see these incredible air particulate levels. Uh, the worst smog in the world. Yeah. What do you see as a solution there? Well, they have, they're, they're, I mean, I personally think that the Chinese are getting blamed and sort of spanked in the, in the, in the press more than they should, okay? What I mean by that is, is that if we look at how much CO2 the United States has kicked out versus how much the Chinese have kicked out, there's like a factor of three or four. We, we completely, and, and, and and in mathematics, we would say that the integral of, of this is that, you know, it all adds up. So even though China has surpassed us in CO2 emissions right now, they still have a long way to go. To, so when we say you shouldn't do this, I have a problem with that. Now, to address your question, I think that the, the, the president of, Me of, of China actually has an agenda to, to make some improvements. And... I mean, they have a lot of problems, okay? They've got um, meteorology that's a problem. They've got a lot of dust. I mean, if you go there, the roads, you know, they're dug up, and, and so there's just, you know, uh, part of the earth that's in the air. And then you've got these horrible diesels and stuff that are just spitting out. But they're, they're working on this. I, they really are. And this is what's good is, is that I think that if, if in this next year, once the Hong Kong results become a little bit more distributed, um, that they will try and institute some regulations and say, we want to try and do this. And I really think they're trying, but they've got this huge, huge problem. I mean, you're right, it's horrible. I mean, I go there three or four times a year, 
And I remember once in Xi'an, as I was on the tarmac, my airplane was waiting to take off, and this airplane took off. The plane disappeared before it took off. So there was like a one kilometer visibility. Horrible. So it's bad. It's bad. Um, but I think they are trying to do something. But it's cooking. It's coal. Everybody uses coal there. And their coal has more than 10% sulfur. So they make all this SO2, which makes sulfate aerosols. So there's just a lot of things that need to change. Um, you told a lot of really nice stories. Um, and I just wanted to get an idea of if you had one piece of advice you could offer us. Um, there are some really important lessons you've learned in your life for the students or people who are going into your, that are starting out. What would that be? What would you say to us? Um, I would say that you can never go wrong if you're trying to make a positive impact that benefits people besides yourself. Um, I think that's an important thing is we need to look beyond ourselves. Um, and, and, and once again, I've, that, that's sort of been my thing um, instilled in me as a kid by my parents and then um, sort of forced into me when I was in the military. But I mean, just trying, you can't go wrong. You, I mean, and you have to love what you do. I mean, don't be a student in engineering if you like to write stories and, and you should be in English. I mean, you, you really need to, as I said in this thing, I said 300 days a year, I probably work 330, um, but 300 days a year, I love coming to work. I mean, I look forward to work. I have wonderful colleagues, great support, great students. I mean, who wouldn't? You know, I'm not working in a coal mine somewhere, you know? Um, but, but if you're not really excited about the work that you're doing or the work that you see yourself doing after you graduate, then that's, that's sad. So choose good parents and a good project. Nowadays, compared to the Vietnam era, veterans seem to be much more appreciated and uh, have more popular support. What can we all do to, what's, what's paramount that you see in the veterans' needs today? Veterans of all ages, how can we be uh, more caring of them? Well, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm, I work with the student veterans organization on campus, and I think it's wonderful. They have their own um, facility where veterans can go and hang out and talk, and, and there are different programs for them. Um, I think it's just an appreciation thing. I, I, I mean, I, but there are veterans who are uncomfortable. I have a, a, a guy in my group, okay, he was a Marine, and he, he's not here, um, but he told me that when he was in Iraq, that he was, um, he cleaned house, or he called himself a house cleaner or a keeper, or I don't know, something like this, which meant that he would go in a building, room to room, and when they found somebody, it was two shots to the head and two to the chest. Okay. So he, after his tour, then had some time when he was in Japan. So when he's here and somebody says, you're a veteran, he says, yeah, and they, and he, they say, where were you stationed? He says, Japan. So there's, there's still this horrible stigma about having done bad things um, because that story that I just told, some of you are going, man, this guy's a beast. And uh, in reality, uh, was just doing what he was ordered to do. So uh, just appreciate vets, that's it. I think for us old guys, it's too late. <laughs> no, I mean, it is, it is, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, I go through the airport and I see people in uniform and I get tears in my eyes when I see people clapping and stuff and I'm, I'm so happy for them and yet I feel so empty because none of that happened to me. And I, you know, I was no hero. I mean, I, my only injury was a broken foot playing basketball, okay? <laughs> but I came home to my family, 
That was it. They were the only thing at the airport. Now, when my nephew came home from Iraq, there were like banners and film crews and all kinds of stuff. And it's wonderful. That's how it should be. So we need to continue that. Okay, this has kind of gotten kind of depressing. How about a happy question? <laughs> like the one about me meeting my wife. <laughs> Because um, a lot of time environmental problems are so political issues. And are there um, circumstances that you make a recommendation based on your research, but there are competing recommendations that you think is not really the good solution, but the government or the involving party will choose the solution over your solution? And how do you deal with that? Do you speak up or do you try to fight against? the other solution? Uh, you know, as scientists, you just try and put your best work forward. Um, I mean, Sherry was wonderful at going to Washington, D.C. or going to the state capitol in California to discuss and to try and educate. But when it comes right down to it, um, and there were times when industry was trying to refute everything Sherry Rowland said, um, there's only so much you can do. You just you just need to try and persevere, but if, if the cards are stacked against you, then the cards are stacked against you. Sorry, not a very happy ending. Do you have one more? Let's make a quick comment, maybe, and ask a question. Because I was lucky enough to meet you and Sherry my first day here on campus. And we're both my heroes. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that. Um, I work in communications, and the Blake Group, uh, separate from Sherry Rowland as his successor is incredibly highly regarded globally, I find, by many scientists and by NASA and no one others, so it probably embarrasses you, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, an example... This is my sister, by the way. I put yourself on other people, but um, I'm trying to think what the question was. Oh, I guess you asked it because I do wonder what scientists can and should do. I was a journalist before I started working here to affect some real change. So my overriding question for you and Sherry that first day and for scientists moving forward is, is there any hope in terms of climate change, in terms of the greenhouse gases? I do feel like what you just said is part of the answer. I mean, somebody in your group recently did research in Canada and the government and industry kind of went after her. The first thing they did was say, well, you didn't follow US EPA protocol. So it was very refreshing to just be able to say factually, actually US EPA was using the Blake Group's protocols <laughs> for their testing. So I do think the quality of the work speaks for itself. But I'm just wondering if you have hope in terms of solving this well, I mean, climate change is just... Very rampant, sorry. It, it, climate change is a huge problem, okay? And, um, you know, if you go back to the tobacco industry back in the, the 60s and, and stuff, how they put out information that was just wrong, trying to distract, you know, is smoking good for you or is it bad for you? Um, that same thing, that machine that was developed during the smoking and tobacco thing, then changed gears when Sherry and Mario were saying that CFCs were going to destroy stratospheric ozone. So there was a group of people, scientists included, who were paid to say, you know, this is not good science. This is soft science. Now with climate change, it's the same thing, okay, that, that there's a, a, a a uh, small minority of people who are either being paid to say that people like Don Blake are paid huge amount of money to do work that only allows me to get more and more money. That that's the only reason I do it. And you know, I, I, I just look at people and I say, you know, I don't work 300 days a year on something that I don't believe in. I mean, that this is, this is real. And I, I mean, the good news is, is that many other countries 
are acting. And, and it's actually a little embarrassing to go to meetings as a scientist, as a climate scientist type, and have the other countries be the ones that are telling us all the things that their countries are doing, and we sort of sit back and go, well, you know, good for you. No good answer, Janet, sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think, I think this will be it. Let's give Don a big uh, round of applause. Thank you, Don. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I just want to uh, remind everybody to come next month, and uh, Celia Lynch will be our speaker. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.